I invite you to turn in your Bibles, which I trust you brought with you, to the book of Romans, chapter 7. And hopefully you grabbed the bulletin when you walked in, because on the back side of the bulletin is an outline, and that will help you as we go through this passage. Folks, I don't know if you've discovered or not, but sometimes when we read passages of Scripture, they're hard. They're difficult. And uh, Paul has an interesting writing style, and so sometimes you have to read things a couple of times to figure out what is it that he's trying to say here. And so I want to applaud and encourage and bless everyone who reads their Bible every day, and sometimes we can read through a chapter or two and not really take in what it says because it just takes a little longer. You know, I love milkshakes, you can tell. You just have to suck on a straw and it goes right in. I also like a juicy steak, but that requires you to chew a little longer. This is a passage of Scripture that requires us to chew a little bit longer. It's not easy. You know, a few years ago, my sons, maybe out of guilt because they weren't there to help me anymore, they decided that Dad needed a better weed whacker. They bought me a real nice one, one of those ones with one of those lithium batteries on it. My oldest son, who knew that his dad wasn't the brightest light bulb in the pack when it came to the mechanical things, said, Dad, it's very intuitive. You'll be able to work it with no problem. Well, that was good until that twine needed to be replaced. And I looked at it, and I had no intuition for it. So I called him, and I said, Son, how do you replace this? I can't figure out how to get this stupid top off or bottom, whatever it was. So, Dad, I'll send you a link. I figured, what did sausage have to do with any of this? Well, then I get a text, and there's a, a YouTube video that shows exactly how to change this play. Well, you know what? That was helpful. It only took six times of watching it to fully figure it out. But finally, I got it. And now I can do it every time. So, folks, we don't always get it the first time. That's why we want you to go home with your Bible. Go home with your outline. Continue to talk about these things because they're very important. So before we start reading the Scriptures, know this. I think you do. There are a lot of people who struggle with life. They struggle with life on various levels. There are those of you who are here this morning that there's things going on in your life that you're struggling with difficult. Sometimes it's a situation that has arisen in your life. Sometimes it's sin that you're dealing with. You know, there's a variety of people that even can be described in the Bible that are dealing with struggles. There's, there's lost people out there. What we're talking about with Decision Point, what we talked about all weekend with our organic outreach conference. There are people out there that are simply lost. You say, well, that's a, that's a really tough word to use for those people. Well, Jesus said, I have come to seek and save the lost. The lost. They're lost in their sin. They're slaves to sin. And often living in denial, not realizing what really is going on. But there's a tremendous amount of emptiness. And we can see that emptiness in our own country. It's trying to be filled by so many things that can't fill it. There's lost people out there. You know, there's people out there, many of who are in this room, that are justified. In other words, they've received salvation from Jesus Christ. They are grateful. They're filled with joy because they are no longer under the death grip of sin. Well, there are also those people around that are that walk victoriously. I mean, it's like a whole other level. They understand that eternal life doesn't begin when their heart stops ticking and they go to heaven. They realize that eternal life has already started for them. They're not only heaven-bound, but they literally have the opportunity to bring heaven to earth through the ministry that they have within them because of Jesus. It's beautiful. And now we're going to come to a passage of Scripture. We're not going to read the actual verse for a few minutes, but we're going to come to a place where the Apostle Paul, okay, the Apostle Paul, this arguably greatest missionary that's ever lived, the Apostle Paul, is going to refer to himself as a wretched man. And it kind of throws you when you read it. Paul, a wretched man? What's going on there? 
I mean, a wretched man at, at, at the very surface level would, would say he's a, he's a beat up man. But wretched literally means he's suffering, he's afflicted, and he's miserable. That's what wretched means. So how could Paul, somebody that on a human level we should aspire to be like, why is he referring to himself as wretched? What is this all about? Can we find ourselves in the same condition as Paul, as Christians? Have you ever found yourself in a position where you could say, what a wretched person I am? I mean, really, if Paul had progressed to the point of being a victorious person in Christ, how could he be wretched? So what we're going to do is we're going to unpack chapter 7, and we're going to discover the relationship between being a believer in Jesus Christ and the law. I believe if you listen, follow along, and maybe you're going to have to chew on this a little longer afterwards. You're going to get it. It's going to make sense, and I hope that you have greater tools to go forth from here and how to live as a Christ follower. So, Romans 7, verses 1 through 4, let's read them. It's an example from Mary. Apostle Paul says this, Since I am speaking to those who know the law, brothers and sisters, don't you know that the law rules over someone as long as he lives? For example, a married woman is legally bound to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law regarding her husband. So then, if she is married to another man while her husband is living, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law that if she is married to another man, she is not an adulteress. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were put to death in relation to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. You belong to him who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. So Paul is doing what any good preacher can do. He's giving a good illustration here. And he's giving an illustration from marriage, an illustration that the people who were listening to him would have easily understood. A man and a woman are married to each other, okay? There's, there's that, that law of marriage that exists between them. There's a legal arrangement that goes on here. As long as the man and woman are living, they are to be legally married together. If the woman, husband, dies, she is released from the law of marriage because the husband is gone. She could remarry. If, while they are married, she goes off with another man, she is considered an adulteress. She would be breaking the law. That makes sense. Okay, now we have to apply it to the situation at hand. See, we've already spoken from the book of Romans that the believer is not under grace but under the law. But then what's this whole thing about death and dying? I can explain it in one verse, a verse that's very familiar to you, a verse that you should write down in your margins if you don't know it. Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20, listen to these words. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Who no longer lives? I, we, we don't live anymore. But Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Wow. So when we receive Christ as our Savior, we die to sin with Christ on the cross. It's not me that's living anymore. I died to that. I died to that. And so now we live in faith in Jesus. Christ lives within us. So something died. Remember the marriage relationship. The husband dies. No, we die. We die. And now it's Christ that lives within us. This is how we're able to live by grace and not under the law. See, no longer are we here to try to do, do, do and keep the law perfectly because we can't. We can't do that. Christ paid for our sins, and He now lives through us. The Lord lives in us through the Holy Spirit. He lives through us. Let's move on. Why does God 
God give the law. Verses 5 and 6. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions aroused to the law were working in us to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law since we have died to what held us, so that we may serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the old letter of the law. Okay. Let's talk about the law for a moment. Why does God give the law? I give you a lot of reasons for the purpose of right now. I'm going to give you two. First of all, the law opposes our sin. The law opposes our sin. Why? So we'll repent. And so that we will come to the faith. When we realize the law, when we realize that, yes, I am a thief, I am an idolater, I am a coveter, I am a murderer, I realize that I'm guilty of all these things, what am I going to do that brings us to repentance? of which we receive the forgiveness of sin because of what Christ did on the cross. The law opposes our sin. And when we become a Christian, we, the first thing we do, I always say, A, B, C, admit you're a sinner. Admit we are a sinner. And then confess those sins, repent of those sins. How do we know that we're a sinner? The law. We know that we're sinner because of the law. The second thing that the reason the Lord gave the law is the law opposes, excuse me, exposes our sin. Exposes our sin. So, folks, many of you in this room are believers. You're Christians. You have said, I have made that commitment to Christ to be my Lord and Savior. And now we still need the law because what it does is exposes our sin. That's one of the reasons why we read the law. You know, if the speed limit says 35, what do you do? 45. Thank you that there are a few sinners in our midst here this morning. Yes, I all see 35 miles an hour people. If the sign says wet paint, wet paint what do you do? You touched it. If the sign says, don't throw coins in the fountain, what do you do? People throw coins in the fountain. I love all those signs that they have, and then there's like thousands of dollars in there. If the sign says, stay off the grass, what do people do? They go in the grass. You see what happens? Those are laws. And when those laws are there, it, 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 sometimes I wonder if they just took down the signs, what would we do? Okay. The law always exposes our sin. When it comes to our lives right now, as Christians, we have this thing that Paul mentions is called the flesh. The flesh. What is the flesh within the Christian? It's our rebellious nature. Now, folks, as you sit here, and you reflect on your own life. Do you have a rebellious nature? Do you have this little attitude that's got a little flicker inside you that says, no, I don't want to do that. No. I mean, think about it. I'm not here to grab you by the back of the neck and smear your face with anything. Okay, but listen. Why don't we do the things that God wants us to do? Is on the table. Why don't we do his command? Why don't people want to come to church even though they say they're Christians? Rebellious nature. Why don't people read their Bibles as God has told us? Rebellious nature. Why don't people want to pray or pray out loud? Rebellious nature. We have that rebellious nature in us called the flesh. It's there. I think we're aware of it. Different people rebel against different things. I'm not going to do that. That's that rebellious nature. See, the flesh always wants us to behave like the world. Like the world. You don't have to do that. You can do anything 
more. So there's that little thing that fills you in with it in it. And that little thing can become a big thing. Folks, this flesh, even as a Christian, is going to stick around until we go to heaven. Doesn't mean we're not saved. But I think you all recognize the opinion that this flesh that's there. And see, Paul also described the Spirit. The Spirit defines our new nature. When we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, what we're receiving is the Holy Spirit within us. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, cannot disobey the Lord. Because the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit cannot disobey the Lord. So here we got the flesh and the Spirit. And there's a struggle that goes on inside of everyone who is a Christian. We must know this. We've been released from our legal obligation to serve the world. Before we were a Christian, that's what we did. We served the world. What, 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 what did Paul say? Serve the world that would bear fruit unto death. What was fruit? It's unto death. Before we were Christians, that is what we naturally did. But now we have the Spirit within us to live through us. Let's go deeper. Let's go to verse 7. What should we say then? Is the law sin? Absolutely not. But I would not have known sin if it were not for the law. For example, I would not know, have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, do not covet. And sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandments, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life again. See that? To life again. And I died. The commandment that was meant for life resulted in death for me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me. And through it killed me. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just. And good. Therefore, did what is good become death to me? Absolutely not. But sin, in order to be recognized as sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that through the commandment, sin might become sinful beyond measure. Now, folks, that's a tough passage of scripture to follow. So listen up as we unpack this very briefly. The first question that gets posed is this, is the law sin? So what does Paul say? By no means, absolutely not, whatever translation you have. The, the law still has its purpose in our lives. It still calls us to account for our sin. It exposes the sinfulness of our flesh. Now let me talk about the value of a spiritual MRI, but let me talk to you first about an MRI. I can't remember what all those letters stand for, but it's a really long word. Most of you know what an MRI is. Sometimes the doctor orders an MRI. Okay, it's something you go into, and there's this machine that can expose things in your body that other things can't see, that an X-ray can't see, or a CAT scan can't see, or a doctor's stethoscope can't see. So what happens is, there are times when somebody has an MRI done, say for instance, and the MRI reveals a tumor in an early stage. And because it's revealed in an early stage, it can be treated. Whereas if it was found later, in a later stage, perhaps it couldn't. Now, here's the question. Do you get mad at the MRI for revealing the tumor? Do you get mad at the MRI for revealing the tumor? No, you don't. Thanks be to God for the MRI. They can reveal those things so that things can be addressed. It makes you deal with the problem. Well, folks, for us, the law becomes our spiritual MRI. At first, before I was a Christian, before I was a Christian, 
it actually showed me that I was on my way to a death sentence. Because, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. So when, the, when that spiritual MRI was given then, that helped me realize, oh, I need to do something. I need to confess my sins. I need this tumor called sin in me to be removed. So does the law cause death? No. It doesn't cause death any more than an MRI causes cancer. Let's move to verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold as a slave under sin. For I do not understand what I am doing, because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I think. Now if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. So Paul's starting to dig a little deeper here. He's talking about this flesh. And Paul is being very personal here. He's talking about his struggle with the flesh. See, the flesh can still impact the believer. Before someone becomes a believer, the flesh serves sin and feels the condemnation of the law. That's why, folks, you know, we've got so many, we've got some people that are out there lost and they're empty. And oftentimes they can feel the condemnation of their bad, sinful choices. And that's what the law is doing. They know that this is wrong. They know that to do these drugs are wrong. They know that to do these bad relationships are wrong. They know to have these terrible, they know that they're wrong. And, and, and it just leaves a void in them. And so the law has revealed their sin. And then what happens to the one who becomes a Christian? This was mentioned, I think, last week. Uh, regeneration. It means the Holy Spirit takes up residence in the believer. We get a new nature. And the struggle is on. The flesh wants to serve sin, and the Spirit serves righteousness. The flesh wants to serve sin, and the Spirit wants to serve righteousness. The Spirit's here, but that flesh has got something still ticking inside of it. Let's dig deeper. Verse 17. So now I am no longer the one doing it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now, if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one that does it, but it is the sin that lives in me. So I discover this law. When I want to do what is good, evil is present with me. For in my inner self, I delight in God's law. But I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. It's as though Paul now is digressing into this thought process and says, oh yes, deep inside, in my soul, I want to do that which is right. I know the spirit is in me, but there's this flesh that's warring within me. Do you feel the struggle at all ever in your life? Do you ever find it difficult to do those things that the Lord has asked us to do? And you almost feel like there's another voice in you that says, you don't have to. You don't have to go there. You don't have to do that. You don't have to read that. You don't have to say that. You can remain bitter at that person. That's all. Call them a name. You really, you sense that struggle that goes on there. You know, there's cravings in a recovering addict. Now, folks, first of all, we're all addicted to sin, so we're all, we've all been addicts here in this room. You don't have to go to a 12-step program to find these people. But when somebody gives up alcohol, drugs, porn, bad 
relationships, whatever their hangout may be, there is often an ongoing hole there. So I've had the privilege of walking with many people in addiction, and, and people I'm so proud of. They've been 25, 30 years sober. How's it going for you? They'll say, please, God, I'm 25 years sober. Well, what, what, what's going on inside of you as it relates to alcohol prison? It's not a day that goes by. But when I think about it, I don't think it's there's something in them that still wants that because for so long that's what they gave. Now, some people might be on the victorious side. They say, I've never desired one ever again in my life. Most people that I've known in recovery, recovery still find a craving there. And they arrange their life in such a way so that that's not in front of them. So that they're not so tempted by it. There is a fleshly pull towards sin. Even though we have a new nature, the flesh seems to have a mind of its own. At times it can feel like it's just joy to us. To do the things that we hated the most. This can be true of believers. When you become a believer in Jesus Christ, the Spirit wants you to do the things of Jesus. Meanwhile, the flesh wants you to do the things of your old nature. So just like the addict, dear people, the body that has been sober for so long still can't have a hearing for this or that or other bad things because the flesh wants more. We're going to finally be free of all of this when we go to heaven one day. And because all of us have been chronically addicted to sin, we still have craving. Amen? Yes, reluctantly we say that, but it's true. Satisfying those cravings, the times that you give into it, it might give you some sort of short-term relief, but actually it's long-term anguish. Tim Keller, an author, a pastor, many of you have heard of him, very godly man, passed away a few months ago. One of the quotes that he's known for that I think it would be good for us to ponder a little bit is he said this, You are more sinful than you could dare imagine, and you are more loved and accepted than you could ever dare You hear the bad news? The bad news is this. You are more sinful than you could imagine. But you are more loved and accepted by God than you could ever hope. Both things go together. Last two verses here. What a wretched man I am, Paul said. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself am serving the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. Paul finally reaches a place, as, as he's no doubt dictating this to the person writing this down, he comes to a place where he just says, What a wretched man. What a wretched man. This is terrible. What a wretched man. So that doesn't sound so positive, folks. But did you say the same thing yourself? When you're dealing with still this junk that's in your life, what a wretched person I am. Paul appears to play a big, bleak uh, picture here for the Christian. He used the word wretched to describe himself. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever watched this, so I'll confess that I've watched these movies probably more than once, but Rocky movies. You can take that picture down. Take it down. Not yet. Honey. I have to set it up for you. Erase that picture from your mind. Now, boxing is a perfect example of what it means for flesh to fight flesh. And if you've ever watched boxing or boxing in a Rocky movie, you know this. Two fighters go at each other. Heavyweight championships can often go 15 three-minute rounds. Think about it. 
They pound each other, they pound each other, they pound each other, and they pound each other. And at the end of that boxing match, the referee will typically come by one of the beat-up people. After 15 rounds, nobody is unscathed. And what they will do is they will raise their hand that this is the victor. Their face might be all beat up and a mess. Look at the picture. Folks, oh, that's wrestling. Whether he's victorious or not, that's wrestling. And the question is, is that how we look? Is that what our life looks like? Because see, when we try to fight flesh, that flesh in us with flesh, that's what we end up looking like. That's not what we're designed for with our new nature. With our new nature, we're designed for a much greater hope. The Spirit is within us so that we don't have to look like that. We don't have to be a mess like that. We can actually come forward with this with victory. And this is what we're called to do rather than fight, 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 flesh on flesh. What a wretched person we are when we do that. But what does Paul say next? The wretched person finds rescue in Jesus Christ. There is another way so that we don't look like what he did in that picture. See, when we are a believer, we receive the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit's goal in our life? Well, the Holy Spirit's goal is to point us to Jesus, to pursue God. And so as we're pursuing God, and when we're occupied with that, what happens is that will address that flesh better than anything else. That's why Paul later says, we must stay in step with the Spirit. We must live by the Spirit. We must do things as the Spirit would tell us. That is the greatest antidote to the flesh in us. So folks, I'm going to sound like a pastor for just a moment here. Maybe even a little pastoral man. But this is the reason we do the things that we do. See, when we go to church, we're living in the Spirit. When we read our Bibles, we're living in the Spirit. When we worship, when we really worship, we're living in the Spirit. When we pray, we're living in the Spirit. When we help the poor, we're living in the Spirit. When we share our faith with others, we're living in the Spirit. When we serve in the church, we're living in the Spirit. When we bless others, we're living in the Spirit. When we fellowship with others, we're living in the Spirit. When we disciple others, we're living in the Spirit. We submit to others and be discipled by them. We're living in the Spirit. Oh, Pastor, that sounds like it's all church. Amen. Amen. If you want to live in the Spirit, then we got to live in the Spirit. If you want to live in the TV, live in the TV. If you want to live in your, all your hobbies and live in your hobbies, you'll become like that. But if you want to live in the Spirit, you're going to be able to deal with this flesh that's in us. If you don't want to live in the Spirit, you're going to look like Rocky. It's going to be a mess. God has given us so many spiritual disciplines so that we would live in the Spirit. The Spirit points us to Jesus. And let me, let me close with this passage. Paul said it so well in Philippians. I think we got the uh, the words. I think we got that Philippians three. There we go. Uh, let's read it together. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of Him, I have suffered the loss of all things. And consider them as dung, so that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death 
assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Wow. I think by the time Paul wrote this, he realized he didn't want to live in that wretchedness. Folks, we don't, we shouldn't wake up in the morning and say, I'm a wretch. That's not, we should, we should say, I'm a child of God. I have a new nature. I belong to Jesus. And then when we belong to Jesus, what we do, like Paul just said here, I'm willing to give up everything, everything, so that I can follow Jesus. I'm willing to give them up. As a matter of fact, everything else in my life is as dumb. If you don't know what that means, ask somebody later. It's done. It's done. The things that I do, that I walk in the Spirit with, those things point me to Jesus. They help me to know Jesus. And so that's the Spirit working in us to get to know Christ more. And so when we think about that, to know Christ more, knowing Christ, knowing Christ, doing the things that Christ has called us to do, that's the pathway to holiness. And you know what, folks, when we do that, we are going to stand like white light out in the dark world. The dark world needs the light of Christ. Don't get stuck in wretchedness. Find yourself doing the things of Christ. Doing the things of Christ as Christians. Doing the things of Christ. And we have a message for this area and for the world. Let's pray again. Father in heaven, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. We thank you, Lord, for the honesty of Paul, sharing the struggle that he had within himself. Because, Lord, we can identify with that. And, Lord, we haven't been brought out of the house of bondage so we can enter another house of bondage. We have come into freedom. And so I pray, Lord, that all those disciplines that we have available to us each day as families, as individuals, as married couples, that we would practice those so that we wouldn't get stuck in wretchedness, so that we would find ourselves led by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, knowing Christ more each day. Oh, we love you. And may all the glory go to you in Christ's name we pray. Amen.